Alright, so I started thinking about this the other day and it dawned on me that there are a couple more things about the peptide bond that I wanted to just discuss and uh, clarify and give you kind of a different way of looking at it here. So what I drew here were just two generic amino acids. We don't know exactly what they are, I just labeled them R1 and R2 for the side chains. It really doesn't matter in this case because what I'm trying to show is the um, is the peptide bond. So, and I'm also showing the charges. We have a negative charge over here and a positive charge over here. And basically, what winds up happening is this kind of, this area here is what's going to be involved in forming the peptide bond. So, what we can draw here to kind of demonstrate this is here we're going to lose water because that's what happens when you form this bond. You lose water. You lose two hydrogens over here and one oxygen over here. And that's how it's formed. So then we can draw NH3 with a positive charge. C, R1, hydrogen, carbon, double bond O. And this has the NH here. This has the NH here. Another C. An H, this is our R2, this is our C double bond O, and our O minus. And now we formed the peptide bond here, and that peptide bond is actually right in this area right here. So we formed the peptide bond, and essentially it's this bond right here. That's the peptide bond, and this is what's called the amino end. And this is what's called the carboxyl end. So carboxyl end. Okay, so we have an amino end and a carboxyl end. Now the other important point that I wanted to make about this was that whenever you have one of these peptides, whether it's like a dipeptide in this case, just two amino acids, or it's some kind of polypeptide which has many, many amino acids, you're always going to draw them from the end terminal so end terminal over to the C terminal so they'll always be end terminal to C terminal that's the direction of the peptide chain so that's the direction of the peptide chain. So that's the direction of the peptide chain. So I just wanted to make that point that um, there's a specific direction to these peptides. They're always N terminus to C terminus. And I also just wanted to show a different representation of maybe how to think about forming this um, peptide bond or amide bond, depending on what you want to call it. So when the carboxyl group of one amino acid reacts with the amino group of another to give an amide linkage and eliminate water, a peptide bond is formed. So that's exactly what we did here. And in proteins, upward to 100 amino acids are so, are so joined to form polypeptide chains. So essentially a polypeptide chain is many amino acids linked together by these amide bonds. And the next thing I want to say, which is, I already started looking at protein structure, so I just wanted to discuss this because it's important. Um, what you'll see here, if I were to just come over here and just draw the end here, I'm going to just draw this. And I think you'll see what I'm doing in a second as this comes together here. So I have this N, and I have this C up here, and I have this random groups here. So all I'm showing here is an amide bond. That's exactly what I'm showing here. I'm showing a peptide bond. And what I want you guys to notice is that there's a lone pair here. Right? Remember from organic chemistry there's a lone pair on the oxygen because it's attached to three different groups and has a lone pair. So what can happen here actually is there's a resonance form and this is this is important because this has a lot to do with why we get the specific protein structures that we get, why we see alpha helixes, why we see beta sheets. So I'm going to draw the resonance form. So basically what can happen is this can happen like this 
and these can get kicked up like that. And I should show also that there's two lone pairs on the oxygen as well. So I'll draw my lone pairs in on the oxygen as well. And I'm going to go down this way, draw my resonance arrow. Remember your resonance arrow is a double-headed arrow, not a single-headed arrow. And I'm going to show what happens here. So this becomes O. Now it has a negative charge on it. And instead of two lone pairs, it has three lone pairs. The C down here, that's really quite insignificant for what I'm showing here. And this forms a double bond. So we actually have a resonance form where there's a double bond here and a positive charge on the nitrogen and a negative charge on the oxygen. So we have this right here. Now you might be saying, well, why is that significant? What, what the hell does this mean? You know, and why does this make a difference? And the reason it makes a difference is because this partial double bond character here introduces rigidity. It's kind of, I mean, you learn this in organic chemistry. When you have a double bond here, it's a little bit more rigid than a single bond, and there's not free rotation. So there's no free rotation around this double bond. And that's why it's important, and that's why we start to see that there's some regular structures that uh, occur with, um, with polypeptides when they fold, when they when they start becoming when they start having secondary structures and tertiary structures, that we start seeing these regular structures, namely the alpha helix and the beta sheet. I mean, there are others, but when you talk about secondary structure protein, at least in an introductory biochemistry course, you're going to mostly be talking about the alpha helix and the beta sheet. So, I just wanted to show that this was um, that this is so, and that there is this partial double bond character here and it does make a difference in the three-dimensional structure of the protein.